Praise the Lord tonight. Amen. We certainly need God. Amen. To hold our hands. Give me a little bit more tonight. Give the church say hallelujah. God is a God that is nigh. The scripture said he's even nigh in thy mouth. So we, we, we can have someone, saints, that is willing to hold our hands. Amen. Through the troubled times. Can the church say amen. We sing a song uh, that he didn't promise that the road would be easy. Amen. But yet, the road that we have to travel, God will uh, certainly be there with us. Can the church say hallelujah? So we bless God tonight because there is a God in Zion. Can hallelujah? And I am certainly thankful and grateful for everything that he's done in the church and allowed us to, to have. Saints, let's continue to pray. There are uh, multiple multiple people that are sick um, this we're entering into what they call the the cold and flu season and, uh, and certainly there's a bug that is going around but yet God is still faithful so let's pray for our brothers that God would certainly give them what they need touch their bodies strengthen them and um, keep them from any hurt harm or danger so we thank God for that and certainly he's able to do great and marvelous things and I just want to, as a, before I started this Bible study, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Amen. And may, amen, your holidays be bright. Amen. And may Christ be the center of it all. Can the church say amen? Because as we commonly say, he is the reason for the season. Can the church say hallelujah? We celebrate Christmas to remember the triumphant birth of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords stepping into the world um, for the sole purpose of redeeming man praise the Lord out of his condition can the church say hallelujah I don't know about anybody else but I needed him I need him now praise the Lord I needed him then and I'll need him praise the Lord for eternity thank you and without him I can do nothing praise the Lord and I'm just so glad to to have the opportunity because God gives every man an opportunity just have the opportunity to even be in his in his presence the Bible said in his presence there's fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore so we thank God for that so if you're down just get in his right hand can the church say man get in his presence praise the Lord get the oil of joy praise the Lord for the garment, uh, get the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Get some joy, get some oil in your lamp. Praise God, and you'll get happy. Can the church say hallelujah? So we thank God. He is certainly wonderful. I want to continue what we've been teaching um, for the last three or four Bible studies on the importance of the church. The importance of the church is fundamental. Amen. For every saint of God to get to, I don't know if this is going to turn into a Bible study on church government, but for right now I just want to talk about the importance of the church because the church is vital for the survival of the uh, the believer it is vital without the church there is no success praise the Lord there is absolutely no success for anybody outside of being in the church we are all connected to one another can the church say amen and this is what the Corinthian church dealt with in that day um, when Paul as the pastor writes to them and admonishes them the fact that they had to be one as it were as he was one can the church say man or not Paul uh, not Paul as it were being one but Christ is one so the church saints is one the church is together the church is not divided praise the Lord because he's coming back for the body praise the Lord he's coming back for his body and we are members in particular so we don't stand alone but we stand together as a whole can the church say hallelujah so the church is important it is the most important place that anybody could be in on the face of the earth praise the Lord it's not to be um, have how can I say honor of men and to have our name in lights and to have people know who we are but it's to be in praise the Lord the called out group 
the ecclesia, praise the Lord, the assembly of God, praise the Lord, Mount Zion, all of these titles that we've been going through in the Bible simply shows the importance of how much God, I, much God is in love with you, praise the Lord. We are his bride and anybody who gets married, praise the Lord, you get married, why? Because you are in love with the person that you get married to. Can the church say, man, you don't marry them because you don't like them. You marry them because you have something in common with one another. Something, there's a mutual love and affection. Can the church say, man? So God is in love with his church. He is in love with his bride. Can the church say, man? Now, we've been talking about the bride, and we got to the point where we saw in the book of Revelation where the bride has now been called up into heaven. Can the church say, man, we go into the bridal chambers, we're caught up into heaven, and there are some descriptions in your Bible as to what the bride is called in glory. Now remember, when you look in the book of Revelation, saints, this is simply symbolic language. It is not literal. It is uh, symbolistic, which means it is representatory of something else. Praise the Lord. So we have to make sure that when we look at this, we don't take it as literal, we take it as figural, uh, figural as to what God is trying to tell us. Can the church say amen? Let's go back to the book of Revelation, and I'm going to start in chapters number four. I believe that's where we left off, but we're going to read uh, chapters number four and verses number one. When the door was open in heaven, can the church say amen? The door will be open in heaven. Um, and we will enter into our eternity. Can the church say amen? That is those that, um, that were buried, that were dead in Christ, those that were alive, were alive and remain, also the Old Testament saints who walk with God under the law of Moses also will be caught up in the uh, resurrection of the saints in the rapture can the church say amen now remember this without this resurrection or without Christ as it were being raised again uh, then this resurrection in which we will be a part of would not praise the Lord uh, take place be quiet this resurrection would not take place can the church say amen so let me go here tonight all right, verses number, verses number one of chapters number four. All right, what did it say here? After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The after this is, ab is after the church dispensation. Because prior to this, remember, I, I think I said a, a few Bible studies ago, is that when Paul, when, um, when excuse me, when John writes I believe it is in Revelation 1 and 11 he says he tells him to write the things which thou seest so the book of Revelation starts with the church dispensation can the church say amen so what you're seeing is from the church dispensation on praise the Lord and I and I told the afternoon class that the book of Revelation is the only book of prophecy in the New Testament can the church say amen? This is the only book of prophecy that we have. There are no lost books of the Bible. Everything that we have or God wants us to have, we have. So there are some people who come up with these lost books of the Bible, the books, the Apocalypse of Peter and all of these other books and uh, uh, the Apocrypha and all of this foolishness. Those are not inspired writings and I'm going to give you a little history before I get into this, that there was some controversy when, the, when, our, when our canonicals was put together as to what book to add as the last book of your Bible. And some of the, some of the uh, scholars in that day wanted to put in the, um, maybe they were thinking, as it were, of putting in the Apocrypha, or the, not Apocrypha, but the, um, the Apocalypse of Peter. But as they begin to read the ap Apocalypse of Peter, they saw some contradictions. One of the passages in the, uh, and I don't, I don't have it before me, but one of the passages 
in the, apoc uh, in the apocalypse of Peter was that Peter was having an argument with Jesus, praise the Lord, about uh, some uh, point of doctrine or what have you, praise the Lord. And so they decided, of course, this could not be inspired by God because how could Peter have an argument with Jesus when, G when Peter was one of Jesus' disciples? But there are people who have tried to tamper with the word of God. And I believe wholeheartedly that we have exactly what God wants us to have. And one of the reasons why the book of Revelation was added as the last book of your Bible and was written, of course, by John is because when, when, the, uh, when, the, um, when the scholars got together and begin to compare what what was written by John in the book of Revelation as to what they also saw in the Old Testament writings such as Daniel these writings line up praise the Lord accurately because what you will understand if you read the book of Daniel saints the book of Daniel is the um, the book of Daniel within that book is also you will also see the tribulation period Daniel did not see the church dispensation. The 70 weeks of Daniel, we'll teach on it one day, does not deal with the church dispensation. Praise the Lord. They were not in, those, in, in, in that particular writing. The, those 70 weeks were not 70 day weeks, uh, 70 uh, uh, 24 hour days any, anyway. They were seven year weeks, which is a period of 490 years in which Daniel did not see the church dispensation. Can the church say amen? But what he did see was, this, was the last seven years of tribulation. Praise the Lord. So this, can, this convinced those, uh, uh, how can I say, those scholars in that day to add the book of Revelation to our canonicals, to our inspired writings. Praise the Lord. Because remember, the books were put together after the apostles were dead. Can the church say amen? These, when... What you see right now was not written while John was alive. It was written, but it was, not put in, it was not put in the form in which we have right now. Can the church say amen? So what we're seeing here when the, after this has to do with after the church dispensation. Praise the Lord. I'm simply teaching this because I want you to know the importance of being in the church because if you get in the church, you'll be a part of this. Praise the Lord. If you don't get in the church, you won't be a part of this. Now this is where we will be. And if we are not in this, we will be, praise the Lord, in the tribulation period in which you don't have anything to do with that, trust me. Can the church say amen? All right? So let's look at this tonight. Read verses number one here. He said, after this, I look. Who's that I? That's John. I look, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now I want to talk about that door for a minute. Now, in the book of Genesis, saints, that um, the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings, and every doctrine that we preach in the apostolic church can be found in germ form, in its basic form in the book of Genesis. Do you remember what happened when God, praise the Lord, judged the world, praise the Lord, in their wickedness in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, where God judged the world because of the imaginations of their heart, were evil continually. He found one man that found grace in the eyes of God. And the Bible said in the book of, I think it is uh, 1 Peter, around chapters number 3 and verses number 20, the Bible said that eight souls were saved by the water. The scripture tells us that they went into the ark and what, what did God do? He shut the door. This is a type of the rapture of the church. Praise the Lord. That we see where God brings judgment onto the world. And the Bible says seven days after God made the commandment, they went into the ark. That is a type of the tribulation period. Because everything that we preach in the apostolic church can be seen in the Bible in some type, figure, shade, fashion, praise the Lord, or pattern. Can the church say amen? So I'm simply trying to draw your attention to, to let you know that what we teach is truth. This ain't something we cooked up. Our fathers taught this. God backed this up with his word. And if people cannot back up what they believe with the, with the scriptures, don't believe it. I don't care how well it sounds. Can the church say amen? So we see a type of water baptism 
because the Bible said eight souls were saved by water. We see a type of eternal judgment in which God opened up the fountains of the deep and rained down, uh, as it were, um, rained down rain from heaven. You know what the fountains of the deep are? The well, the springs of wells of water underneath the ground. He opened up so they had water coming down from the heavens and they had water coming up from the earth. And it flooded the whole earth. Can the church say amen? Forty days and forty nights. What is forty in your Bible? Forty is a type of judgment. Did you guys know that? Forty is a type of judgment. It's also a type of trial. Israel was judged how many years? Forty years in the wilderness. Can the church say amen? Jesus fasted for what? Forty days and forty nights. Moses what? I think Moses wasn't he in the mountain? I'm trying to get it right. In the wilderness. 40 years. He was on the backside of the desert. What? 40 years. Can the church say amen? Getting prepared. So this is something that we just need to draw our attention to. So, so the door, just as God shut the door in the days of Noah. Praise the Lord. Those that were inside were saved. Those that were on the outside were what? Lost. Can the church say amen? God in this sense is going to open up a door. Now, if we go back one verse, you will see saints, or two verses, you will see that he stands at a door and knocks. What is that door? That door is your heart. And if we let him into that door, when this door opens, we'll enter in. Can the church say amen? These are all this simple. This is this language to draw attention to the fact of the importance of being in the church. Can the church say amen? This is not to everybody. This is to those that are part of the bride of Christ. Can the church say amen? If you're not a part of the bride of Christ, you won't get this. But he's calling all men to come and receive this. Can the church say amen? Because he loves all men. I read the scripture in the book of, I think it was, 1 Timothy 1st Timothy chapter 2 verse 4 where he said it's not his will that any what should perish but that all would come unto repentance and to the acknowledgement of the truth he is a mediator between two covenants so let's look at this a door was old was open in heaven read in the first vo voice which I heard was as a trumpet talking with me saying come up hither now there will be a trumpet that we will hear and that trumpet will cause the dead in Christ to rise and those that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him while I'm on that resurrection there are seven stages saints of the first resurrection praise the Lord three of them two of them have already passed the third will occur when the rapture of the church happens and then after the rapture of the church happens four four uh, orders they're called orders we call them we call them stages but they're called orders will happen bishop during the tribulation period the first and I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about it tonight because they they will also be a part of the heavenly seed but four of them will occur and we'll get to it a little bit later the Lord will can the church say amen all right come up hither and I will show these things which must be hereafter the hereafter is after the rapture of the church now he's going to get into the tribulation period but in this particular chapter we have descriptions of us in glory of the church in heaven which is going to be a beautiful experience can the church say man read here all right it says behold a throne was set in heaven and what one set on the throne. There was a throne in heaven and one set on the throne. What's that throne? That's you. Can the church say amen? You are that throne. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians. I want you to read this here, what Paul says about the Corinthian church. Because Paul was trying to get to the, the Corinthian church to understand the position that they had in God. In as much as, I think it's in the ninth chapter. I think it's first. uh, 1 Corinthians 9 or 10. Let me see here. I want to be correct here. Mm, let me see here. 
Let me see if I can find it real quick. We may have to come back to it. Mm, the num chapters number 10, possibly. All right. Let me see here. Somebody find the scripture, if you can, where it says, well, Paul tells the Corinthian church that they're going to judge angels and cannot judge these matters as it were between themselves. I'm trying to find the scripture because I want to make sure you, we understand. Let me see. This may be it. Let's go to the um, 1 Corinthians chapters 10. Let me see here. I think I know where it's at. Maybe chapter 3. Well, anyway, 6, what's that? 6, 3? All right. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. I know it was in the Bible. I wasn't wrong. Can the church say hallelujah? All right. This is what I wanted here. It says, this is the church judging. This is the church as the throne. Can the church say Amen. Please excuse me for that miscue, but I know it was in your, in your Bible. It says, know ye not that ye shall what? Judge angels. Now, we're going to judge angels. What do you judge from? You judge from a throne. Can the church say amen? We're going to make up the throne of God. Can the church say hallelujah? We're going to make up his throne, all right? You shall judge angels. He says, how much more things that pertain what to this life what he was he was condemning them as it were tongue-in-cheek because the fact that God was going to in in um, in the in judgment give them greater judgment that they had down here yet they were not able to deal with matters amongst one one another and this happens yet today people have disputes in the church have issues and can't seem to deal with them according to Scripture now, I'm not here to talk about this particular tonight because this deals with church government, but there is a way to get disputes solved in the church. If you have ought with your brother, go to your brother. But many times we can't go to one another because people are discarnal. They get upset. They get mad. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Bishop, if I walked up to you and smacked you in the face, you ought to be able to come to me and say, Elder, you was wrong, and you need to repent. And I ought to be able to say, yes, I'm wrong. I need to repent. But sometimes people are this wrong as two left shoes and won't get it straight. And if they won't hear you, bring the brother. If they won't hear your brother, go to the, praise the Lord, go to the church. What's the church? The church court. Can the church say amen? Mm -hmm. Go to the judge. The church court, the pastor and or his board of rulers, the deacon board. In the church, amen. But this is what was happening. And I don't mean I don't mean to get off on this, but in as much as the church saints is going to have the responsibility to judge angels. What are those angels? The fallen angels. Can the church say, Man? We will be judging with the Lord those fallen angels, those demons, Lucifer, the wicked one, praise the Lord, the, the serpent, the dragon, and all those that follow him. Praise the Lord. As the throne, we will make up the throne. And Paul was saying, you can't deal with these little matters in which is coming into the church today, coming to church right now. And I'm not going to talk about exactly what it was because it will take up too much time. Verse number four, it says, if, what it says, here, what it say here? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life set to judge who are least esteemed in the church because remember the least shall be the greatest the first shall be the last what he's talking about is the ones that are the humblest of those that are your servants are the ones that should be judging in the church now I'm trying to I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this and I'm going to let it go in the church you have a servant who's the servant of the church the pastor praise the Lord and then those that God puts in the service in the church to judge these particular matters. Can the church say amen? Because the pastor is a servant. He's not the big, a big shot. <laughs> God's the big shot. 
Can the church say amen? So what Paul is saying, you take those that are least among you, those that have given themselves the servitude to judge the matter. Not the person who got the big head who think they're supposed to be doing something because the person who got the big head who thought they were supposed to be doing something obviously in this case didn't judge the matter because the young man was still walking around fornicating with his father's, his, his, uh, father's um, wife or his mother-in-law. Yes, his, his, did I say that right? His, his father's wife, which would be his, his stepmother. Excuse me, I want to get that straight. And nobody was judging it. They was acting like, oh, nothing was happening. This is what was happening in that day. But the point taken is that the church is supposed to make up what? The throne. And who's sitting on the throne? Jesus is sitting on the throne. What does he sit right now? He sits on the throne of our hearts. He sits in our kingdom, reigning and ruling in our domain. Can the church say amen? And if he reigns and rules in this domain, we can go through that door, praise the Lord, in glory, and he will re reign and rule in our hearts, praise the Lord, and we can make it in. Can the church say amen? He will not be a part of our life. He has to be our whole life because the Bible said, when, 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 when he who is our life shall appear, then shall we appear with him in what? In glory. See, people want a part of Jesus, but don't want everything. I got to have him all the way. If I'm not sold out, praise the Lord, I'll sell out. And we got a lot of apostolic sellouts. People say they sold out and selling out everything that you can think of. Let me stop here. I, sometime you, you got to pray for me. I get off on a tangent, and I can't keep on subject. All right? Where are we, where are we at? Verses number... Three, all right? I preached this this Sunday. I didn't get through it all. One day I'll have to preach it again. He says, and he was asked, he says, and he that set was asked uh, to look upon as a jasper and a what? Sardine stone. We talked about that sardine stone Sunday, and Jesus was asked to look upon as that, what, that sardine stone. Can the church say amen? And in this particular, um, this partic these particular books, these particular two chapters, seven times you will find the mention of he that sat upon the throne, him that sat upon the throne, or one that sat upon the throne. So anybody in the world who thinks that when you get to heaven, you're going to see three, praise the Lord, you're going to see God in the middle, the sun on one side, and a dove sitting on his shoulder. Praise the Lord. How many times did God have to say, he sits on the throne, one that sits upon the throne, or him that sits upon the throne? Can the church say amen? Seven times. And what is seven? God's perfect number of completion. So he completed it in these two chapters. Can the church say amen? Okay, let's read here. And round about the throne, what, what was it? He said round about the throne. All right, yes. Let's read verse 4, though. He said, Round about the throne were four and twenty elders. Read. And upon the seats I saw... Uh, and upon the seats... I didn't read that right. And, and I saw four and toward twenty seats clothed in white raiment and they had in their hands crowns. These four and twenty seats with four and twenty elders are four. I didn't read it right, I know. Uh, they are twelve representatives from the uh, New Testament or the twelve New Testament apostles and twelve Old Testament patriarchs. They will also make up the throne. Can the church say amen? Moses will be there. Elijah, Elijah will be there. Praise the Lord. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be there. Can the church say amen? They are Old Testament patriarchs. And you will also see the, these, the names of the 12 apostles, praise the Lord, uh, on the foundation of that holy city that descends out of heaven from God in the, at the end of the book of Revelation. Can the church say amen? So that is what this is talking about. We are seeing a tour of you in, um, how can I say, as symbols 
as to what the church will be made up in glory. Can the church say amen? All right. Let's keep reading here. All right. Let's go. Verse number five. Let's read that. And out of the throne, proceeding light, lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps burning before the throne. Read. Which are the seven spirits of God. The seven lamps is the glorified church. The throne is the church. The seven spirits of God is the spirit of God in each of the seven dispensations of the church. Because remember, the Bible said we were all baptized into one body by one spirit. But that one spirit has been in every dispensation of the church. Can the church say amen? This is you and I in heaven. Praise the Lord. And we, when we get down here, we're going to see what we're going to be doing in heaven too. Because we're going to be in, we, we are not going to be in heaven, praise the Lord, having a pity party. We will be in heaven praising God. Can the church say amen? So anybody say, well, I don't like it loud. When you get to heaven, you're going to have to have a new body to be up there. Can the church say amen? Hallelujah. Because when you get to glory, it's going to be a whole different ball game. Can the church say amen? All right. Let's keep reading here. What did it say? And before the throne, there was a sea of glass. Now, I want, to keep, want you to keep that in mind. We won't be able to read it tonight. But before the throne, it is what? A sea of glass. And what you're going to see, as I, I can't teach it tonight, but when I teach the book of Revelation, you will see before the throne, there are certain groups that are caught up on that sea of glass out of the tribulation period. Those are the virgin's companions that follow her that I talked about a couple Bible studies ago in the, book, um, in the book of Psalms. They are the servants of the bride. They come out of tribulation. They're not the bride. They are servants to the bride. Just like when you sisters go, praise the Lord, and get ready for your, uh, for your big day. Praise the Lord. What do you do? Do you go get dressed by yourself? No, you have some bridesmaids. The bridesmaids carry your dress, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. They, they may help you get your stuff together. Now, men don't do this because I ain't going to have no men help me get dressed. Can the church say amen? Now, this is not what we do. We get ourselves dressed. Isn't that right? I, my brother was my best man at my wedding, and he didn't help me get dressed. Can the church say amen? I can get myself dressed. But the point taken is that that's just what women do. So certainly, if we can understand this in our culture, we can understand that there are some people that accompany the bride. They make sure her train is right, her veil is on right. Praise the Lord. Now, we have some saints in here who were in each other's weddings, right? Wasn't um, you guys in, um, in um, Shirley and, and uh, David's wedding? And I know that you probably helped her and she probably helped you. So we can understand this. So that sea of glass, there are going to be four groups that are caught up before God on the sea of glass. Can the church say amen? Out of the tribulation period, out of the first three and a half years of tribulation, they will also be a part of the church, but in a lesser role. Can the church say amen? We have the greatest role. We are the bride. We got the good stuff. Can you hear what, I, you hear what I'm saying today? You got the best thing going. Can the church say, man, you and I saints have the best thing that is available. Oh, hallelujah. I'm glad about that. You got it. And if we miss this, we missed it all. And somebody said, well, well, if, if, if I, what if I decide that, you know, I know what I need to do, but I'm just going to just take it easy. We talked about those 10 virgins, right? Last Bible study, those 10 virgins who were not wise. Praise the Lord. Didn't go in into what? The bridal chamber. Tried to get in later and say it was too late. The door was shut. Can the church say amen? Now when you go into the bridal, when I got married and I was saved. I was really saved. My wife didn't sleep a night with me and two. Praise the Lord. We said I do. Not only did we say I do in front of the church bishop, we signed some papers. You and I'm telling you, we made it Hallelujah, we made it legal. You know what I'm saying? Because trust me, a ceremony without no legality is this a ceremony. You better sign some papers or you a polygamist or whatever they call it. You are breaking the law. Hello? 
And what happened after we got married, I went into the bridal chamber. I'm talking good tonight. Did nobody go on with me? We went in together. And that's exactly what's going to happen with the church. He ain't taking nobody in there that he don't want to take. So don't think somebody going to creep through the back door to get into heaven. Ain't no back doors to glory. Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. Only one door. And one way in. And no way out. Do you notice here that when the door open, there's no exit to get out? Because once you're in, you in. And trust me, once you get in this door, you won't be trying to get out. Once, I, once we get in here, I don't care what happens. I just want to make it in. You hear what I'm saying tonight? So, praise the Lord. Isn't he good? So this is what will happen, all right? He says, be, uh, before... He says, and before the throne was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four, four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Oh, so let's look at these four beasts. Now the four beasts is also symbolic of the church. And the eyes here has to do with the church in, in every part of the world. The church... God's eyes are in every place beholding the evil and the good. One preacher said it like this. God has no eyes but our eyes. He has no hands but our hands. God's eyes, God's spirit is in every, in all four corners of the earth. Praise the Lord. The church is represented, represented the apostolic church in every part of the globe. Can the church say amen? That beast, all right? Let's keep reading here. And the first beast was like, mm-hmm, the first beast was like unto a lion, and the second was like unto a calf, and the third was like unto the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Now this is, I'm going to show you this in two places. Let's go over to, um, let me see here. Let's go to Ezekiel, uh, chapters number one. Ezekiel saw the four beasts on earth. That is the church on earth. Isaiah saw the four beasts, the church in heaven. Because as we go down and read further, you will see that the four beasts had two wings, had four wings, and two it did fly. The two wings that was added to the four beasts that made it fly was the rapture of the church. So one prophet saw it in earth and the other prophet saw it in heaven. But the four beasts we're going to read about also in the book of Ezekiel. That is when Ezekiel sees it on earth. All right? Ezekiel um, chapters number one, I believe. I believe that's exactly where I want to go to tonight. Yes. One in ten. Let's look at this. And it is representative, it is represented as the four gospels. All right? Those same beasts you're going to see, but they're in earth. Then we're going to see it again in glory. That's another symbolic language of the church. Can the church say amen? Verses number 10. Let's read it here. And for the likeness of their faces, in the four, and it says, uh, they four had the face of, the, of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four had the face of an eagle. This is representatory of the four gospels and or the church in the earth. This is what he's seeing. He's seeing right now the church on the earth. Praise the Lord. Let's go over to what um, Isaiah saw because you're going to see these four beasts, praise the Lord, before the throne, but two, with two wings they did fly. That is dealing with the rapture of the church. All right? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6, where he is in the spirit, praise the Lord. He sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he also sees the church. But he didn't see the church on earth, he saw the beast in heaven. See, some people think the beast is only talking about the Antichrist. There are more than one beast that you see in the book of Revelation. This is all symbolic language, but it has a spiritual meaning behind it. 
Can the church say amen? Isaiah 6 and 4. Let's read that. 6 and 4. 6 and what? Yes, yeah, 6 and um, 1. Let's go back to verse number 1. This is Isaiah seeing the church. Can the church say amen? It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting on what? On a what throne? What's that throne? That's you. He saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. Did he say he saw two sitting on the throne? He saw who? The Lord. Who's the Lord? Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So Isaiah saw who? One Lord. Didn't see three. Didn't see four. Praise the Lord. So this is the same symbolic language that we see in the book of Revelation. But you're going to see the difference here that in this particular chapter, he sees it with wings flying away into the bridal chamber. Can the church say amen? All right, read here. High and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Because every bride has a train. Can the church say amen? And above it stood the seraphims. These are heavenly beings. So, mm -hmm. I said each one has six wings. And with... three and one cried unto another holy 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 is the Lord the whole earth is full of his glory you see it had six wings with two it covered his face with two it covered his feet and with two it, it did fly so this this is symbolic of the glorified church in heaven so he's seeing the throne in heaven he's seeing it with six wings praise the Lord Two it covered its feet, two it covered its face, and the other two it did fly. So once the bridal, once the, uh, once the rapture of the church takes place, we are going to what? Fly away. And you also see that they're crying, holy, holy, holy. In the book of Revelation, they're crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Can the church say amen? So this is the same symbolic language. Praise the Lord. And in verse number two, you see that with two it did what? Fly. Can the church say wait? Church, excuse me, church say amen. Let's go back to the book of Revelation and then you're going to see the rest of the language here. Can the church say amen? So one saw the church on earth, the beast on earth, and the other saw the church in what? Heaven. Flying away into glory. Read here. Verses number, let's finish verse number uh, six. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne, there were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and the first beast was like unto a lion, the second beast was like unto a calf, the third beast was like unto a man, and the fourth beast what is, and the fourth beast was like unto a flying eagle. Read here. And the four beasts, each of them had what? Six wings round about him, and they were full of they were full of eyes within, and they rested what? Not they, they rested not saying what holy 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 Lord God Almighty which is which was and which is to come so here we see the we, we see the church with what six wings just as who saw it Isaiah saw it with six wings so he sees the church in heaven as the beast praise the Lord with what six wings can the church say amen and this is talking about who us you and I, that's going to get to heaven, praise the Lord, and see him in glory. And we sing the song, I will fly what? Away. Oh, glory, I will fly away. We're not, we didn't make that up. Praise the Lord. That is scripture. We are going to fly away. Can the church say amen? When we fly, fly away, we ain't coming back. Can the church say hallelujah? Because, Sister Sharon, when I get there, I, I don't care about what happens down here. Can the church say hallelujah? I would have made it. Do you not, do you not know, saints, that he's, he, right now God is taking all of your prayers and bottling them up? He's got your tears in a bottle? And you're going to be rewarded for all the prayers that you pray in the spirit? Did you guys know that? And he's going to avenge the prayers that you prayed 
praise the Lord, in the spirit and those that persecuted you? Did you guys know that? He's going to do it. Yes, he will. We don't have to pray that anybody gets hurt. We walk in the spirit. But those who persecuted the church, praise the Lord, who put those down who were the part of the body of Christ, those, all those individuals, and I'll teach on it one day, that, um, that how can I say it, that uh, killed the saints, praise the Lord, during the church dispensation, millions of saints that were, that were martyred, there were all, the, the Catholic Church saints killed 50 million people. You hear me? 50 million. And none of them went to jail. They're going to go to jail one day. And this jail that they get into, they will not be able to get out of. And some people teach that when you get, when you get, when God throws a, uh, these individuals into the lake of fire, they say, God won't, God is a loving God. Yes, he is a loving God. He loves everybody. But trust me, once God's takes the church out of here. He is done dealing with those that will not uh, uh, receive him. He will no longer be a loving God. But he will be a God, praise your Lord, that will avenge the blood of the saints. Do you hear what I'm telling you tonight? So we better be on the right side of his judgment. That's why I tell people, you keep your mouth off saved folk. Keep your mouth off the saints. Because when we put our mouth on God's people, we're going to get in trouble for it. Can the church say man? All right. So that's what we're seeing here. Let's keep reading here. We're almost done. Verses number, let me see here. Verses number nine. And when those beasts gave what? That those beasts are you. You're not a beast in terms of a beast of the field, but you, these, this is symbolic language. All right. Um, those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to what? Him. That's another description. Him that sat on the throne, which what? Which liveth forever and ever. Read. And the four and twenty elders fell down before him. He sat on the throne. That's another one. Read. And worship what? Him that liveth forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne. Now some people say, well, um, they want, see some people just want to be recognized. These 4 and 20 elders had crowns that was given to them. Now, now, we don't get those crowns that they had. We're going to get a different type of crown. But they had crowns. But they were so humbled just to be in the presence of God, they didn't even take their crowns. They took, took their crowns off and cast them before him that sat on the throne and said, we're not even worthy to wear the crowns. But you are worthy to wear the crown. Can the church say amen? All right, let's finish reading here. Cast their crowns before him, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created what all things, and for thy pleasure they are, all, they, uh, they are and were created. For whose pleasure? For his pleasure. Can the church say amen? For whose pleasure? His pleasure. Now, I told you that there are four groups that also make up the, that also will be caught up before him on the sea of glass. Now let's look at those four groups here. Let's go to the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation, chapter number 12. This is what we call the man-child. Praise the Lord. That will be caught up before him on the sea of glass. There will be 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the, our Jehovah's Witnesses brethren have, have made a great mistake, and they used to teach, and I'm just going to tell you what they used to teach. They used to teach that there, will be, there was going to be 144,000 that were going to be make it to heaven. But they had a flaw in their doctrine, because as their numbers grew, there were more than 144,000 that believed in what they taught. So then they came up with another doctrine. Those are those 144,000 were the 144,000 elite best ones. <laughs> you see the flaw in this? Can the church say amen? There were the elite special forces that were going to make it to heaven. Praise the Lord. That 144,000 is not talking about you and I. That is the man child that will be caught up in the middle of the tribulation period before um, 
before the throne on the sea of glass, 12 out of 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Can the church say amen? Let's read here in verse number 5 of the 12th chapter. Okay? And she, what? Brought forth a man child. That she here is Israel. Can the church say amen? And this occurs in the middle of the tribulation period. She, what? Brought forth a man child. Read. Which was to rule all nations with the rod of iron read and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne they are caught up to God unto his throne on what the sea of glass can the church say amen now remember remember I, I talked about that Israel was God's ruling element in the world in that day and somebody made the notion Bishop where they said well why did God allow war and or um, some of these catastrophes that happened in that day where they were conquering nations and there was bloodshed. The reason why God was doing this because God has always had two seeds. He's always had the righteous and the unrighteous. Right? The, the unrighteous nations around Israel did not follow God. And God was using Israel as his rod of iron. His ruling element in the earth. Praise the Lord. That is what God was using the children of Israel as in that day. But their problem, saints, was that they were so caught up in trying to be like the world around them that they forgot what they were supposed to be doing. Because thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal was not to the world. That was to Israel. He wasn't telling them they weren't supposed to kill the wicked nations around them. He was telling them, uh, Sister Casey, they were not supposed to kill their brother. And their brother was their fellow Israelite. Praise the Lord. Because you have to remember, these nations that were around them were heathenistic. They were ungodly. They had no intention on serving God. They were corruptors. Just as in, and I'm going back here a little bit to give you some history, just as when Cain killed Abel. What did Cain do? He killed the godly seed. Isn't that right? What did God do? He, ra ra uh, he raised up Seth after I think Adam was 130 years, he had Seth brought a new godly line. Praise the Lord. And then later on you will find when the Bible talked about the sons of, um, sons of God went into the daughters of men. And I had to correct myself with this because I thought that it was angels that slept with, slept with women. That was not what he was talking about. Angels have no gender. That was talking about the fact that the evil seed mixed with the sons of God or the good seed it created evil in the world and giants were produced there was always giants but when they mixed in with the ungodly what we saw was that now the, the imaginations of men were evil continuously there was sin running rapping in the land it was such debauchery and everything that you can think of was going on so what happens is this whenever saints we intermingle with those that are ungodly and become common we will always come on come out on the short end of the stick because we will lose our identity you will find this all throughout the Bible this is the reason why our fathers taught us the way they did Saints because they understood the importance of when the church begin to get to begin to function like the world praise the Lord begin to do what the world does begin to follow the traits the fashions the ideology the uh, uh, philosophy of the world praise the Lord we always are tainted praise the Lord so I got off on that tangent to tell you this Israel was supposed to be God's ruling element and what God is God is doing in the middle of the tribulation with this 144,000 the first three and a half years of tribulation saints is to purge out the rebels because the Bible said in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans uh, verse number 25 Bishop that all Israel shall be saved what that means all that are of the godly seed those that will follow God will be saved out of Israel he purges out the rebels he get those through the three and a half years purges them out those that follow the Antichrist will not follow God you will see that the enemy will come in in this chapter he will persecute them God will take a, a bride uh, he will take uh, how, how can I say a portion of them out 
they will be caught up before the sea of glass. He will take the rest of them and hide them in the wilderness for a space and time. For a time, a time and a dividing of times, if you read in this, in this book, that is three and a half years. Just like God protected them in the land of Goshen, didn't he? From what? The plagues that were happening in Israel. I mean, the plagues that were happening in Egypt. Same thing, in, in, that was in germ form. That actually happened, but that was also a type of what God was going to do in the tribulation period. But he has to get the rebels purged out. And this man-child is caught up and will serve you and I. That's the first group. Can the church say amen? That's the first group that's caught up. And the rest of those will be put away in the wilderness for a space of time. Because remember, Israel goes into their millennial three and a half years before anybody else. Because they will be, as it were, in a, in a, in a sort of paradise, tucked away. When God is hell, when, 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 when fire mingled with blood is coming down out of the sky, and I told you what that meant, somebody thought it was going to be fire in the hell, no uh, blood in the hell. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that when these 100-pound blocks of ice fall out of the sky and hit somebody on the head, what, know what's going to happen? It's going to be mingled with blood. That's going to, now, preferably, if, if the, when the rapture happens, Praise the Lord. Three and a half years pass and God begin to break, begin to rain down. As Bishop Paddock said, his big guns on the earth and blocks of ice start falling out of the sky. You know what's going to happen to this roof? It's going to tear right up. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to teach it one day. I'm going to teach the whole book of Revelations from, from, first, from beginning to end. And you're going to see what's going to happen for those that are not in the church. Scorpions are going to descend out of the bottomless pit, or hell, the river, the, out of Euphrates, out over there in the book, in, over there in the land of Iraq, the land of Shinar. Praise the Lord. The land of Babylon is going to de scorpions are going to descend out of there. They're going to have hair like a woman, teeth like a lion, face like a man, bodies like a horse. They're going to have a blessed breastplate. I don't know what these things are. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This is all symbolic language. But he's going to command these scorpions, praise the Lord, to hurt men. And on top of that, saints, while all this is going on, it's going to be pitch black. Can you imagine? Pitch black. I don't know why I'm going this route, but I'm trying to get the church to see, to get ready. Praise the Lord and stay ready. It's going to be pitch black for a third part of the day and a third part of the night. Praise the Lord. It's going to be pitch black. There is, I, don't, I think it was, I can't remember, there is a place on earth, I can't remember what they call it, some cavern somewhere. What is the name of those places? You guys know what they are? If anybody knows what they are, speak up, please. You go into these caves, and what they do, they take you into these caves, and then they cut the lights off on you. And they tell you to put your hand over your face. Praise the Lord. And you can't even see that. Your hand over your face. There it will be so dark, a man will not even be able to put his hand over his face. Can you imagine? God shuts the lights out, and then all of a sudden these scorpions come out of nowhere biting you. You got hell coming out of the sky. Praise the Lord. You have men laying on the ground for five months in a quivering mass of jelly. They can't die. Praise the Lord. You got people running into the rocks in the caves saying, fall on us. You got earthquakes that move the whole earth. All of this is going to happen. And yet, Bishop, people still don't want to be saved. Don't want to get in the church right now. I hope my audience can hear this tonight. Don't want to get saved now. Trust me, you're going to wish you were saved when God start raining this stuff down. Can the church say amen? When God starts turning the sea, the rivers, into blood, the stagnant blood of a dead man, praise the Lord, it will be one-sixth of men will be left on the earth at the end of tribulation. Did you guys know that? And we need to get into church right now. That's why I'm singing a song, Lord, let the Savior bless, my, bless your soul right now. Can the church say, man, I got to make it. So, let me get off that. 
So this is the first group. The second group, let's see, that comes up before him on the sea of glass. Go to the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. Because the Bible said, every man in his order. These are the virgins' companions that follow her. All right? Revelation chapter 7. These are what we call the palm bearers. They are also called the souls under the altar, those that were uh, beheaded for the witness of Christ. All right? There's no number that we can put on, the, on, on these individuals, but these are the individual saints that were sincere, yet did not have the truth and had to give up their heads for their salvation. Praise the Lord. This is not us tonight. These are the people that did not know about water baptism in Jesus' name, did not know about being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, but yet had this as much confidence in, the, in their pastor and what they were being taught as you have tonight. And when the rapture of the church happens, they're going to find out that they were wrong and they're probably going to go to their pastor and say, you hypocrite. You told me all these years I was going to make the rapture and, I ain't gonna, and I'm not going to make it. So either two things are going to happen. They're either going to have to starve to death or they're going to have to give up their heads. Praise the Lord. But they were what we would call signified as having palms in their hands. Seventh chapter. Let's see here. What verse do I want? Verses number 14. Yes, verse number 14. This is what John is seeing. And I saw, and I, he says, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So their salvation will have to be that they will have to shed their blood, praise the Lord, in order to be saved, in order to be washed in the blood of the Lamb because there will be no more Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptism, laying on hand, eternal judgment, resurrection of the dead. There will be no more preaching of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Nobody will be saved by that gospel. Can the church say amen? So they are going to have to give up their what? Heads. Can the church say amen? Verse number uh, 15, he says, uh, Therefore, they are before what? The throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. They are what? Did the Bible say they're in the throne? They're before the throne. What is before the throne? The sea of glass. Can the church say amen? The sea of glass is before the throne, and they are on that sea of glass, serving the bride and or the bridegroom. They're in a lesser position. They're still blessed and holy because they are part of the first resurrection, but they are in a lesser position than us. Can the church say amen? Let's go back up and you're going to see these, uh, these robes that they had on and these palms in their hands. Verse number 9. Let's read here. After this, I beheld and lo, what? A great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations, kindreds, peoples, tongue, stood before the throne, read, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and what palms in their hands the only reason why we call them palm bearers is because this is how we signify them this is how we recognize them because in the 20th chapter you will see there is another group praise the lord that will be they, they are simply called beheaded for the witness of christ and you see here that there is a number that no man can number praise the lord what is happening here they're coming in with such rapidity Praise God. It's not that it can't be counted because you can count up to um, a, 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 an inf infinite amount of numbers. But they're coming in so fast that John can't keep track of them. Because remember, when the Antichrist comes on the scene and starts persecuting people, praise the Lord, he comes in first on a white horse, which symbolizes power and purity, but he's disguising himself. He comes in, as Daniel said, with flatteries. Praise the Lord. He's going to come in with all of the world's problems that he says he can solve peace he's gonna come in and everything I got the answers I know what you need but eventually he's gonna show his true colors he's gonna bring a, a red it's gonna be a red horse a black horse a pale horse he's gonna take peace from the earth praise the Lord that means war can the church say man he's gonna show his true colors 
He's going to start persecuting those. He's going to force people to take the number of his name, which is 666, the mark of the beast. And those that won't take it, they will neither be able to buy or sell. You know, we like to go down to, there is a what? I think there's a D&W's down here, isn't it? Is that it? What it is? Family Fair. There's a Family Fair down here on, on Breton. There is a Myers down here on, what is, what street is this? Kalamazoo, right? We can go in there. We can pull out our money. Praise the Lord. We get our paycheck. We pull out our money. And we go and buy whatever we want. But when, the, when, when this takes place, when he brings famine in the earth, you will not be able to, your money will not count for anything. You know what I'm telling you? I don't care how much money you got. It won't amount for anything. Now imagine this. You won't be able to buy a sale. I'm not talking about you tonight. Praise the Lord. You can't eat. He's taking peace from the earth. There's famine, pestilence in the land. There's death all around you. Praise the Lord. The animals can't eat. What do you think is going to start happening? The animals are going to start turning on people. So Fido and the cat, Fufu, Fifi, whatever it is, amen, that we love so much, is going to turn on you. You won't be able to feed them. Praise the Lord. They're going to break animals will be breaking out everywhere the wild animals that we see those wolves is right now in the UP think about it like this when the devil takes peace from the earth there's no food shortage for food famine praise the Lord what is gonna happen it's gonna be a lot of chaos think about all these things happening praise the Lord simultaneously coming on the scene I'm teaching this to the church because I want to be ready can the church say amen? So you won't be able to buy or sell. Praise the Lord. The animals will be trying to break into your house right now in Alaska. Praise the Lord. You go in Alaska. Praise the Lord. I watch the Alaskan Great Outdoor. I don't know what the show is anyway. But these people live on the frontier. And, praise the Lord, Sister Casey, they live out there on the frontier. And they got bears and wolves, praise the Lord, and moose and reindeer in their backyard. Can you imagine what's going to happen when a two-ton grizzly bear is, is, is hungry and the, and, the sea is, and the sea is blood? Praise the Lord. There's no fish. There will be no salmon runs. Praise the Lord. There is no weather. You hear the church say, man, that you guys not know that the sun will be, will be seven times hotter and that it will scorch men? Now, in Arizona... There is a desert out here in, in, in America, right? I think, what is the name of the desert? Somebody help me out. What is the name of it? Mojave, whatever it is. It is, they say, at the height of the day, it is anywhere, it is 120 or 130 degrees. Can you imagine, Deacon, it being 130 degrees in the desert? And it gets 90 degrees, close to 100, 100 degrees in Grand Rapids sometime. Can you imagine when God turns up the heat and it will be seven times hotter and you are, it's, it's no weather, it's 100 degrees, 700 degrees? Hello? We better get in the church. <laughs> you hear what I'm telling you? And it's going to burn, it's going to scorch me. I can imagine men just catching on fire. Right in their wee little boots. And still, Bishop can't die. The fire department can come, and there won't be no water because the sea, the rivers and streams are going to be turned to blood. Some people, some people have taught Sister Amy that this that blood has to do with all the and the blood and the animals are going to what's going to make the sea turn to blood. That's not what he's talking about. Because, because fish have very little blood. This blood is going to come from God. Just as God allowed Moses to turn, praise the Lord, the rivers of Egypt into blood, so it will happen in these days. As a, Praise the Lord. All this is going to be happening. And you know what's going to be happening? We're going to be up in glory, shouting hallelujah, shouting glory, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, hallelujah, on the throne. What a time. What, and I'm only saying all this 
to make us understand that we got to make sure we're ready. So who's going to, this is the second part. This is another group that comes up. All right, let's look at the third group here. The two witnesses, which are Moses and Elijah. Now remember, Moses and Elijah will be caught up, but Moses and Elijah are part of what? The four and twenty elders. So they, are, they won't be on the sea of glass, but they're going to come up out of tribulation. They're going to make up the throne. They are part of the glorified church. They have, praise the Lord, a greater position. But for three and a half years, they will, they will come down, walk the streets of Jerusalem, and preach the gospel. You know what their gospel will be? Don't believe the devil. That's going to be their gospel. They're going to be preaching, Bishop. Don't believe this antichrist, praise the Lord, and all the world will, their eyes will be on these two witnesses. They will hate them. Praise the Lord, because the, when they're coming down, they're going to be bringing down miracles and raining down fire. They're going to be judging men. God is going to give them power. Praise the Lord, just as he gave um, Moses power. Praise the Lord, in the Old Testament. Did you have something to say, Bishop? And Elijah. Yep. Mm -hmm. They're also called the two candlesticks, praise the Lord, that are beside, as it were, the seven golden candlesticks. Let's read here in the 12th chapter. Did I say the 12th chapter? 11th chapter. And remember this, the book of Revelation, just like the books of the Bible, are not written in direct order. God did this for a reason because he didn't want men to be able to pick the Bible up and to get an understanding. So the Bible is not written in direct order where you can pick it up and read it like a novel. This is not a novel. That's the reason why when men try to read the Bible, they say, well, I don't understand what, what this is. You need the baptism of the Holy Ghost to get the revelation. All right? What verse did I want here? Verse number 12. I said uh, 11. I said 11. Uh, yeah, chapter 11 and verse number what? 12 here. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go back to verse number three here. Okay? And he says, I will give power unto my what? Two witnesses. Who are those two witnesses? Moses and Elijah. Read. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. So a thousand two hundred and three score days, praise the Lord, is three and a half years. Can the church say amen? Which they are going to prophesy. They're, they're going to be preaching to Israel. Can the church say amen? And their message is not to believe the devil incarnated in the beast, the false prophet, I mean, of the beast, the Antichrist. That is their message. Don't believe the devil. And I'm trying to get everybody tonight, don't believe the devil. Don't believe the devil because he's always going to lie to you. Can the church say amen? All right? Verses number, uh, let me see here, three, four. Verse number four, read here. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God, God of the earth. Now, we can also read it. We won't have a chance to read it tonight. I got to let you go. Um, but you also see is when we get back, we'll look at these two olive branches in the Old Testament. They are standing Beside, if I'm not mistaken, the seven golden candlesticks. This is Moses and Elijah. Moses was buried by God. No one knows where Moses was buried. God took God buried Moses in the mountain. And Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind into heaven. Can the church say amen? God knows where they're at. And when it comes time, he's going to take his two witnesses and they're going to come in the streets of Jerusalem preaching. And the Bible says that they're going, these uh at the end of this three and a half years that they're going to kill these two witnesses and they're going to rejoice and have a party and send gifts back and forth to one another now somebody said how are they going to be able to do this remember we have they have what is called technology everybody's going to be able to see it on tv it's going to be on cnn cnbc and all of these other channels i don't know what they'll be but it'll be some type of way for them to be able to get transmit the messages that these two men that plagued us for three and a half years are dead and all of a sudden they're going to come back to life Praise the Lord and, de and descend into glory. Can the church say, man, the devil thought he had them? They're going to get away. 
Can the church say amen? So we covered three groups. There's one more group that we'll talk about when we come back. Can the church say amen? We're talking about the church, right? And I'm only saying all of this, and I'm piecemealing this together, really. But I'm, only, I'm saying all of this so that the church could be ready. Be rapture ready. Can the church say amen? 